Welcome to Journey TV, a conversation about what most matters about religion in New York City. This city is full of buildings and apartments and condos, but how many of them are homes, real homes, permanent places of love and peace? We have a classic uh, New Yorker here with us today, Lauren Green, who's the chief religion co correspondent for the Fox uh, News uh, uh, Channel. Lauren, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, I noticed that, um, you couldn't help but notice that Lighthouse means a lot to you. Because <laughs> I was looking at your book, it's a fabulously written book called Lighthouse, God as a Living Reality in a World Immersed in Fog. Right. This, this lighthouse imagery mm -hmm. fits you in so many ways. Because wow. you, you're architectural in view. You're, you, you see things laid out with an order and purpose. But this lighthouse image had something personal to you. If I remember you telling me that uh, this lighthouse, you have a lighthouse next to your bedside. Right, right. Well, this <laughs> is the, the, the lighthouse, lighthouse faith became um, the imagery for a project I was working on um, researching areas of science and faith, science and religion. And I had heard a, um, a very good sermon from Dr. Tim Keller, uh, who was the pres uh, former senior minister of Redeemer Presbyterian, on the structure of the, uh, structure of the Ten Commandments. And so I thought that sounded like a very a closed structure, a closed system. and. All of a sudden, I started seeing this sort of structure, this sort of closed system in everything. I thought, oh my goodness, this is amazing. But then um, I was going through some personal issues, um, and I was having a hard time. And my friend, Kathy, had invited me out to stay at her place. And this picture of a lighthouse had always been there for a very long time, and I took notice of it. Um, and I think when I started to recover and really started to feel like I had finally gotten back on my feet, I looked over at this lighthouse and I realized there was a symbol that God had always been with me. And this structure of the lighthouse was, in, in, was exactly like the structure of the Ten Commandments that I'd been looking at and researching in all these different areas. And here, God was saying in the most simple way, I have never left you. Um, I'm here with you and I always will be here with you. And it finally just hit me that, um, you know, I'd finally um, looked and saw God who had already been, had always been with me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the symbol of the lighthouse, the lighthouse faith. And not only lighthouses um, are the symbol, but they, but they have the symbol of saving people, lost at sea, or um, a symbol of where to find home. Um, it, all of that is part of the lighthouse imagery. It's sort of funny, you would, you would saw this a lighthouse and a home way out in Long Island in the, so we know Long Island, at the tip of Long Island, right. is an area called the End. Right. <laughs> and Montauk Lighthouse is at the end. So you think if you're at the end of the city, yes. <laughs> you can go no further. <laughs> you're at the end. But this was really a beginning for you, or sort of a new beginning in some ways. Well, absolutely. I mean, like I say, this book was probably researched for probably 10 years. I was a Templeton Cambridge um, fellow yeah. um, in 2009. And so that became part of uh, the the the, the the real research for the book in 2009. Um, but I actually interviewed the historian at Montauk Lighthouse, just his feelings about um, the lighthouse and the history of it. And here he was, I mean, you know, the interview was not a particularly religious interview, it was just give me some of the history of the lighthouse. And, and he, his first look at Montauk was when he was seven years old and he said he saw this structure and it was just, it was just, in awe, and he almost was, he was brought to tears actually thinking about that moment of looking at the lighthouse mm -hmm. as a child. Um, and there's something, um, there's something, um, it is something divine about a lighthouse. And in fact, in the Bible, um, it is uh, the fire on top of the mountain. It is the fire that Moses sees on top of the mountain. And here we have the lighthouse as an emblem of the fire on the mountain. When God like, gave his, his, his commandments. So it's sort of like a f lighthouse faith. Yeah. Or a faith guided by a lighthouse. Right, right. Well, you've, you've made it really well here in New York. You're a tremendous uh, a religion a reporter for uh, Fox News and also for the radio program. 
but I wonder how you got here. Are you from, you're not from New York originally. No, I'm not, I'm not, how could you tell? <laughs> where, are you, where were you from? I'm from Minnesota, um, good hearty Midwesterner from Minnesota, yes. Minneapolis, Minnesota. Most of my family still lives in Minnesota. Uh, family members still live in Minnesota. And um, I grew up um, very middle class, lower middle class kind of um, level. Um, my father worked for the same company for 40 years. Um, lived in the same house um, for that part. It was married, my parents were married for almost 52, 52 years before my father passed away. It was a good home. It was just a good, solid home. Uh, and I, there was nothing, we didn't have a lot, but we had, you know, to coin the phrase, we had each other. Um, the lot of, but it, does, it wasn't smooth sailing. There were some uh, issues with children and various, you know, uh, ups and downs and, you know, struggles, but um, through it all. Did you, know? you, you grew up in a Christian faith then, or? Yes, I grew up in a, uh, yes, it was a Christian home, but I think a lot of people like me um, back in the day, and I think m many Christians even today, they, they're sort of Christians in name, you know, only. Um, but, you know, for me, you know, we did go to Sunday school. We did go to, uh, um, you know, church. And, of course, we celebrated Christmas and Easter. Um, but the faith was sort of the faith that was in the community. I mean, we called it Christmas vacation when I was in grade school. It wasn't, you know, you know, winter break or it was Christmas vacation. Right. We sang Christmas carols at the Christmas show that we would do um, for our parents. And I remember when I was, um, you know, eight or nine and we were doing, we were rehearsing our Christmas um, show and two kids could not participate and one was Jewish and the other was a Jehovah's Witness. And I felt so sorry for them because <laughs> they could not sing Christmas right. and then Santa wasn't going to visit them. Um, but, um, you know, I, but my, my aunt, Retha, was a very, very devout woman and she taught Sunday school and she has, a, she had a lot of faith and in, influence on me and my, and my siblings. I noticed that she had, a, a, that she wasn't, a, she and her husband were not necessarily the most successful people. They had lived in a humble, humble yes. place, but it was sort of like a, a place that you felt a home like at times. Home, I think that home is so much different today than it was back then. I mean, we had one TV, yes. and because that's, nobody had two <laughs> TVs. We had one TV, and then, oh my gosh, you got a color TV? Yes, yeah, it was, that's <laughs> I remember those days. way back. <laughs> um, but my, yes, my aunt um, never had any children of her own, but she gave us so much um, as a sort of a surrogate mother and faith mentor. And I tell the story about how she taught my sister and I a game called Bunkum, and how she would hide something in plain sight, uh, a common object like a comb or a spoon or something in a room, and then we'd come back in and try to find the object. Mm -hmm. And when one of us found it, we would say, Bunkum, and sit down. And then the other one had to go searching for it. <laughs> and I thought about that story um, as I was writing this book and realized how much like um, God is for us. Everybody says, you know, I'm trying to find God and I don't know where he is and, um, you know, why doesn't he speak to us like he spoke to, you know, the prophets in the Old Testament or something. And it's like, I realized that God is hiding in plain sight. There was just, there's no, God is everywhere around. It's like, and I tell how some people travel the world and never see God at all and look at all the wonderful wonders of the world and never see God. And then one day you can look at a rose petal and then see God in all his glory. So like the lighthouse is everywhere. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it really is. It's like we can't see the forest for the trees or the ocean for the drop of water. All of those things are, you know, the Bible talks about God holding up the universe with this basically his pinky, the entire universe. This is, this is um, the most powerful and omniscient, um, omnipresent kind of being, or it's nothing. I mean, and that's kind of the, 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 the dilemma we deal with it. And it's very much, e it's so much easier to ignore that God might exist than to really face this kind of awesome kind of being. But you, you grew up knowing that God existed, but you never really faced him in a personal or uh, there was some distance. I never questioned God's existence. Yeah. I don't think I ever did. That, I mean, 
Um, and there have been studies that show that children come with a natural ability to believe in God. Yeah. Um, I never questioned that, but it's because that's the way we grew up. And we said our prayers, and we said grace before we, we ate. Um, Did you ever pray uh, outside of those, uh, those ritual home rituals? We say our prayers at night. Yeah. Um, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If oh, I yes. should die before I, sh I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Yes, yeah. Which was a very, a wonderful as, as, as I am older now, think about this. Dying before you wake, what a, what a, what a very interesting thing for a child's prayer. To know that yeah. it's put death in the context of going to sleep and thinking that if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That's and, incredible. And that's an incredible prayer for a child to make, because who would think a child would die in their sleep? It was more like an adult would, an older person. And now it becomes more of a powerful prayer as an adult, because it's like you think, yeah, I could die before I wake. I, I could you know, not be here. Um, there's so much richness in the Holy Scriptures. And I don't want to discount other people's religions, but, but I've, I've studied faith in a, from a Christian standpoint, and I've known uh, Muslims who um, who are very devout and have been faced with the, the two scriptures together. And, and when they're faced with the two scriptures together, they have to kind of now make an assessment of their own faith. Whereas Christianity has been pretty well vetted for the last few hundred years. But in some ways, your life, when you came to New York and you went through you know, a profession, you studied journalism, mm -hmm. Uh, you were seen as one of the classic beauties of Minnesota, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's true. I mean, Miss Minnesota, right? Yes, yes, yes. And, did, and then you make your way through Chicago and other places and you end up in New York. Did you leave your faith behind in some ways? No, or did you come no, it actually, it actually grew as I began to go from place to place. I never, I always read the Bible. Yeah. And I remember going to, um, giving an interview uh, for the position in Chicago. And uh, remember the, I don't know what he was, he was like a vice president or whoever did the hiring for the station in Chicago. And he says, well, what are you reading these days? And I said, I'm reading the Bible. And he said, is that really relevant today to read the Bible? I went, oh, and yes. you told him, bunk them, right? I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, yes, it's quite relevant. But then, then I remember I was having a bad day and I went into, um, I went into uh, to do a um, to take an exam for um, a, a, st a study that I'm I'm a part of, you know, a heart study that I'm part of, part of, and it just has nothing to do with it. But I remember the woman I said you know, uh, uh, that was taking me and said, I was saying, oh, I'm having such. I was something about there was a boyfriend issue or this. I can't remember what it was. And then she said to me, you need to you need to give that over to the Lord. And I was like, and it just struck me. I said, here I've been reading the Bible, and yet I'm not making that connection Make of my, connection. my daily life. And said, you need to give that over to the Lord. And as I said, you're right. That, that's done. Yeah, done. <laughs> and when you, you came to New York, you faced some more challenges, right? Uh, well, I mean, I think everybody faces challenges. I'm not, I'm your average person. I, don't, I have not experienced incredible pain or incredible loss in the way yeah. that's different. I mean, I've not been the victim of a mass shooting. I've not been, um, you know, I, I pray to God it never happens, you know, hit by a car or anything like that. I am like many New Yorkers who have daily grinds. You've got to, you know, crank those stories out. You've got to write. You've got deadlines. It's an office building. You know, you've got personality conflicts. Um, you've, you know, have a relationship that, that ends. These are daily struggles that everybody goes through. This is something you, you discovered. I, you went out to Times Square to ask people to talk about their sins. Oh, that it was, you know, this is Tell early on. Tell me about on. exactly what's there, going on there. <laughs> this is early on in the, uh, in the, my, uh, my job as a religion correspondent for Fox News Channel because I was doing something else before and then they said, well, hey, why don't you become a religion correspondent? So I had this great idea to go out and talk about uh, and ask people in Times Square, um, have, you, have you violated any of the Ten Commandments today or, uh, you know, lately? You know, it, it was supposed <laughs> to be a fun kind of thing. 
And you know when you, you thought that they would say, "Oh no, oh no, I, I'm oh, doing no, so I've well. not done anything like that." And, well, you know, I had to bring the list, you know, because yeah. most people don't know. <laughs> They don't know the Ten they Commandments. Get, they don't know the Ten Suggestions. <laughs> it's like, so it's it's like uh, well, I know there's something about murder or something about it. Okay, so I I gave them the list, and the people were looking at it. It's like, ooh, did that one. Ooh, did that. It's like, oh, my goodness. I mean, people were actually confessing. Really? Which is really a... Which what is, did they confess? Well, um, attempted murder, uh, adultery, which was very, oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did you, you, while they're saying this, you think, well, are there police around? I know, it's like, uh, maybe you don't want to tell me that uh, right now. <laughs> and I talk about in the book how the camera became a confessional, but then I also know from the scriptures, it says at the, at the, at, 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 um, the, at, you know, God's word, you know, will, is living and active. And that at the name, um, every knee will bow. Mm -hmm. So here you've got, when when I did the, 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 the sermon, when I did not do the sermon, but when I heard the sermon on the Ten Commandments, I said this is not just um, uh, ten arbitrary rules laid out by God. This is a description of who God is. So here you've got God in the written form because this is me. I don't lie. I don't covet. I don't murder. I don't, you know, commit adultery. So um, you're going to be more like you because you're made in my image if you follow these rules, right? Yeah. So here you've got God now in his commandments saying, um, these are my commandments. And I say to these people, oh, have you violated any of these? Ha, 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 and they go, yes. All, it's, it's like, it was almost like they were facing God. It was exactly what the scripture says, that when you're faced with God, your heart wants to unload and confess to be straight with God. What were they looking for? The people? Yeah, when they were confessing like that, what were I they looking know. for? I don't know. I just think that I think there's something in heart. You know, Augustine talks about um, how um, there is a hole, there's a God-shaped hole in our heart um, that only God can fill. And that when, if, if, if the scripture is correct in saying that the Ten Commandments are now not just a, a list of rules and regulations, but an actual description of who God is, you're actually faced with, the, with, with God in, in some kind of form. Now, the soul recognizes God and says, I have to unload my soul because God knows me. Were, if, if, I, if I say no to this, God will know. Were they sorrowful in those situations? Um, so, no. Many of them were just laughing or they were, someone says, you know, I, didn't, I felt bad about that. You know, I you know, almost killed my da-da-da. And it's like, ooh, I can't put that one on camera. It, 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 how would um, you, or yes, the, how would or you the, respond as a journalist? Here you've got people, <laughs> you've asked them this question, it all of a sudden penetrates into their life. And all of a sudden, you're in a different world. You're in a world where now, yeah. it, right beside them, they're saying, well, I thought about killing somebody, or I tried to kill somebody. Or, and how do you as a journalist handle that? Do you say, well, let's cut, I want to talk to you for a moment? No, or I mean, it was, it was, I never thought about bringing them to the police. That was between them and God at that point. And, yeah. Um, and I didn't know if he was telling the truth. Um, of course not. It, yeah. So, but one of you know, like the other person, you know, like the parents would say, you know, like um, like uh, honor their father, their mother, and the parent and the the child would say, well, I guess I didn't do that this morning or something. I said something wrong. Um, but it was this confessing, and you know, it, it, we talk about it. And the Catholic Church talks about it. And the Catholic confessing is good for the soul. That's why they have confessionals. Now, you um, you mentioned about. Uh, uh, hearing uh, Reverend Tim Keller mm -hmm. preach, and who's mm -hmm. now your pastor, correct? Right. Well, he's um, retired from active, you know, ministry or pastor. He was at which a Redeemer, Presby Redeemer Presbyterian Church, and he was the senior minister of Redeemer, and he actually created Redeemer. It's, it's his um, the reputation um, that the Redeemer is known for is Dr. Tim Keller. Um, and, and he had some impact in your life. Oh my goodness! I I joke. I I joke. <laughs> To him, that said, I'm just going to put a watermark. This is TK on every on every page because <laughs> it, you're, it, the ministry at Redeemer and his influence of teaching us how to explore God's word in a way that's um, so um, something you'll carry for the rest of your life. Um, that is the proverbial teaching you how to fish, not just giving you a fish. He, uh, you were first contacted with him, not personally, but with hearing a. Uh, a tape of a uh, disc uh, CD of his sermon, right? Right, right. Well, you know, I was going to another church, another Presbyterian church in New York City, and um, the, the, the church was going through renovation, so we were having 
um, our services at another location. So you're upheaved so from home. So we're up, upheaved <laughs> from home, and then also you're not in the same pew. You know how you go into a church, or you know, yes. you're, and you always sit in the same spot. Okay, that's my spot. And if somebody's in your spot, oh, you're like wait, at Redeemer. Which <laughs> side do you sit on? I sit on. In the center, because now it's the ministry center, That's so right. I sit in the center in the second row. That's in right. the second row. But at, so this other church I was going to, and I was sitting in a place, and then there was a gentleman sitting beside me um, who never, who I never see the church because we all sit in different places. Yeah. And we ended up having brunch that day, and he started talking about how he also goes to Redeemer Presbyterian, mm -hmm. and... Um, he really loves the preacher and it's really great. And I said, oh, that's fine, you know, and I was fine and because I, I really liked where I was going. And then the very next Sunday, he gave me a CD of uh, Tim Keller's sermon. And lo and behold, I listened to it and I listened to it twice, like back to back. I could not get enough of this. I said, this is blowing my mind, the way to understand sin and God and who we are. And it wasn't like I felt crushed by the weight of my sin or anything like that. It was like, yeah. oh, I could have had a V8, you know? I mean, I really, it was just so simple. It's like, oh my goodness, life could have been so much simpler had I understood this years ago. And it was because, I mean, how did, how did he reach you through his voice that way? Because I know he does that. And how do you, you're, you're an expert in voice. Right. <laughs> well, it wasn't the voice so much, it was what he said. It was understanding that things like drug addiction is um, is, an, is is like the worship of a false idol. You mm -hmm. know, you see, you see, it's it, an idolatry. It, it's an it's idolatry because it's a putting God uh, behind the worship of a drug, mm -hmm. and that adultery is the same way. Yeah. Adultery is saying that somebody else's love is more important to me than God's love. If you steal, it means some, something is more important, more valuable to you than God. Because he said, do not steal. Do not commit adultery. If you're coveting somebody else's house or wife or whatever, this actually gets to the mind. The coveting is, is not, an, it's not always an action. It is how you're thinking, how, which is something that actually propels your action. So if you're doing, if you're coveting, it means somebody or something um, is more important to you or more attractive to you or more wanting to you than God. And that put it all in perspective. I'd never heard faith put that way before. It was sort of a freshness. Absolutely. What it, what, it, what it said is that, you know, going to church once a week for an hour, an hour and a half is not really how you worship. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's the centerpiece of your worship is where you get your batteries recharged, but mm -hmm. your actual worship is out in the world. It's in the world and how you treat people, how you talk to people, um, how you love your family members, um, what you do with your money, how you um, respect your coworkers or your job, mm -hmm. how you think about those things. Your, your worship is out in the world. And his point was that... Um, we all have deep idols that really are controlling us that we never see. We see the surface sins. I haven't killed anybody today. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't, you know, oh, we, used the word. Oh, we've established that? Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I, have a, I, have, I have no, I have not uh, used the Lord's name in vain um, that I can think of. I mean, maybe that one, and I, but, I, but, you know, oh, you know, sorry about that, God. <laughs> um, but we don't see the deep idols. We don't see the ones that... Uh, become the default mode reaction to the world. Uh, and those are the ones that are controlling us. I, well, we don't have much time, but I did want to ask you, you know, that Pastor Keller, who was at Redeemer Presbyterian, has now stepped back and they've, they've, they've got pastors at different sites now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in that, in reflection, do you have any reflection of why he was so successful here in New York City? I mean, who would have thought, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. Who would have thought? Because he has a way of communicating that's smart, beyond smart. I mean, he's wickedly smart. I don't see, not in the evil sense, but I mean, <laughs> yeah. in the sense that he is sharp so as a razor. sharp. And it, there's no bells and whistles. There's no, you know, dancers. There's no, the no videos. It's just good talking and preaching and lecturing and, and opens up the scriptures in a way that's totally, totally accessible, but also um, that's uh, understandable and has and it's powerful. And now that he's stepped back a little bit, uh, 
I, people in the congregations, I'm sure, is saying, well, what's our next step? Mm -hmm. Where are we mm -hmm. going to go from here? Because yeah. they've had this uh, great spurt of growth, and along yeah. with the growth of a lot of churches in, in New York City, Manhattan particularly. Right, right. Uh, where do you see, uh, you're a religion correspondent, so I'm going to take advantage. <laughs> where do you see the next step for them going, or do we know that well, yet? Well, you know, because they've broken off the, the different locations into separate congregations. Yeah. And so the ministers at those locations now are controlling those churches, and what you're donating now is not going into the vast pool of Redeemer Presbyterian, but going to that particular um, church that right. you're, you're actually um, worshiping. Um, at and so in the ministers then become you know the new Tim Kellers of every you know uh, of every church and there's always going to be there was always that question you know can Redeemer um, not just survive but thrive without Tim Keller right. at you know leading right. you know doing five different sermons yeah. a day and uh, we'll see um, I still go to Redeemer and uh, David Bisgrove uh, the Reverend David Bisgrove is the minister um, at uh, the Upper West Side and um, he's wonderful, um, but you know it's hard to grow yeah. under a Tim Keller unless he lets you, <laughs> yeah. and he let them, and he yeah. encouraged them to grow um, under him, and they were able to preach um, several sermons, especially in the summer. So um, it it just. Um, I don't know, it just depends. I mean, I think that the satellite version is what they're going for. I mean, you, they don't have like the video link and everything. It's, and it's really, it can't be about one person. I've got to get this in, because I know you're a classical pianist. <laughs> and you started as a kid, plunking away a little bit. And then you, you actually produced an album, right? Right, I have a CD, it's called Classic Beauty. And I've been trying to get it to get on iTunes. I don't know how else to do it, but uh, I guess I'll figure it out. But I used to sell them the actual physical CDs, and I don't, I don't think we do them anymore. But I do have a CD out. It's called it Classic seems, Beauty. It seems to me like you, you go for classic, a, a, a classic in your bearing and, and, and your appearance, classic in the way you think about things, classic in your musical taste. <laughs> uh, that is, you want to define those timeless, um, those things that will last forever. Well, music does last forever, and um, and so it's been a wonderful journey. Well, we've been so fortunate to have Lauren Green, uh, and thank you for uh, visiting us. You're just welcome. And don't forget her book, Lighthouse Faith by Lauren Green. What a wonderful read.